how very, very strange it is to be saying, standing here in front of you, saying the first of what will be many goodbyes to Adam Lerner and that we'll have over the next few weeks. I have known Adam for many years, and how I first got to know him was through a series of lectures that he did out at Bell Bar called Mishigas, Appreciating Contemporary Art and Things You Learn from Aunt Miriam. And for the uninitiated, Mishigas means nonsense in, y in Yiddish. And contemporary art wasn't my area at the time. I was making interactive gallery games for children, but the lectures were completely captivating. And as we contemplated here at MCA Adam's departure, I asked if he could revisit these kind of talks that he's given on contemporary art as a way to say farewell to all of you, our visitors, and to share the things that he loves about contemporary art, which he's so very, very great at doing. And we can all sit together here at MCA Denver and hear Adam speak about how he arts and why. Adam Lerner. Where you go? Thank you, Sarah. That was so sweet, um, and uh, brings back such incredible memories. Um, do we have anybody who was here from the, the Aunt Miriam days of the lab at Belmar? Yeah, wow, John's been there. Wow, it's incredible. Um, you know, it's funny. I uh, now at the point where I have a tendency to sort of like when I have to give a lecture, kind of. Oh, I got to give a lecture today. Right. Okay. Let me prepare something, and I like put my slides together really quickly, um, and then just you know kind of do my my, my shtick. But um, I actually worked really, really, really hard <laughs> on this lecture. I felt like very, very nervous about it. Um, and I think it's because I, I wanted to say everything. I wanted to sort of say everything that um, I cared about about art about museum about, you know, make meaning out of it all. And um, that's all to say that this lecture is going to be just awful, awful. <laughs> just like brace yourself. It's going to be terrible. Um, so I explain a lot of my approach to art um, from the fact that I grew up in the era of rock versus disco. And, um, and, you know, like, I don't know if anyone here is, remembers those days, but it was kind of, you have to choose one side, and the rock people thought that disco people were not, you know, not serious about music, and, and disco people thought the rock people were just, like, brutes. And, um, and, and I like, like them both, you know? And I, and I feel like that's really just sort of indicative of... Um, everything about how I approach art and maybe even how I approach the museum. I just want to say, too, for the record, that I was probably a little bit more disco. <laughs> um, and that's me there with um, my sister and our square dance caller, Steve Kotman. <laughs> and um, I modeled myself after Steve Kotman, by the way, <laughs> as you can probably tell. Um, and, uh, well, uh, anyway, my square dancing life is another, is another story. Um, but the, the rock versus disco sort of duality that I grew up in, I think, affected the way I thought, because I think in dualities. Um, that was very clear to me at first when I was writing my PhD thesis um, at Johns Hopkins University. One thing, by the way, when you grow up in a square dancing family in Queens, like, you, 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 you tend to have a sort of escapist attitude, and getting a getting a, and, and one way that I approached that was to get a lot of education, and um, and so after getting a PhD at Johns Hopkins, um, well, I worked, I wrote my dissertation on the duality between um, Mount Rushmore on the one hand and the, the aesthetics, the impulses of Guts and Borglum, which were. Um, he was interested in making art that was direct, organic, connected to the land, immediately accessible, um, raw, popular, versus what was occurring at the same time, around the same time, was the Lincoln Memorial, which was traditional, formal, elevated. Uh, it had conventions and symbolism, required you know, decoding based upon knowledge. Um, and, you know, one was sort of this 
organic, one was formal, and that duality was what interested me. Um, and I think in a weird way, that duality um, is something that governed most of what I've done um, ever since then, too, most at the museum. I've always been interested in that tension between art that like, is very close to just our culture, just how we live, and art that is um, more conventionally produced through the traditions of, of art institutions and those formal elements of our culture. Um, so that was, for those of you who might know a little bit about what I've done, the basis of the one good idea I've ever had, <laughs> and that was mixed taste. Um, so uh, I parlayed my obsession with dualities into uh, like a home run <laughs> program. Um, so basically it's a program where we had one, oh, that's, oh, you guys, dudes, we could do this together for the last time maybe. Um, we had um, one speaker speak, around, speak on one subject for 20 minutes, then a second speaker speak on a completely unrelated subject for 20 minutes, and then we had a question and answer of both at the same time, exactly. And um, now during the first two talks, people were not allowed to make any connections, but during the, the final question and answer, anything can happen. And, um, and you know, this was a program that um, basically it came out of just like essentially who I, who I was and how I thought. Hi, Alan. Um, that like, I actually first had the inkling for this program um, when I was in, um, college, I was a resident advisor, and I had to do a program, and all the other resident advisors like did a your educational program like, I don't know, how could I get it, like on time, but for me, it was like the last week before finals, and I hadn't organized anything, and I'm like, oh shoot, I have to do something, and so I just like called the, the health clinic and said, oh, could you guys give a talk on birth control, and I called the um, chicken wings place, <laughs> like, could you guys bring over lots of chicken wings? And, um, and just put up a big sign that said, birth control and chicken wings. And, <laughs> and it was the most popular program of the whole, the whole year. And, birth, and that, was the beginning of, that was the beginning of mixed taste. But again, it's sort of the indication of how I think. Um, so that also suggests something about the very, um, like my, my most favorite artwork um, by Felix Gonzalez Torres. Um, and this is a work with simply two stacks of paper, and um, it's, you could say it's a sculpture that's ever-changing but remains ever much the same because um, it's replenished um, by whoever owns or is caring for the art. And on one sheet of the paper it says, somewhere better than this place, and the other one it says, nowhere better than this place. And to me, that's um, everything that I care about in art, the idea that um, art is, takes you out of this world to some place different, to ideal place, you could say, to fantasy. Um, it, takes you at, to, to, it, it helps you transcend your day-to-day -day, um, on the one hand. On the other hand, um, what art is about is about deepening your connection to the everyday. That there's no place better than this place, and art only just just is um, a, a way of amplifying what is the, what the magic is that's already in our ordinary life. And somehow that tension is not one that you choose, one or the other, but in fact that is the very tension that I think interests me in art. And you could say even the very tension that I found within the artists that have been most interesting to me. And um, there's a series of artists who um, I think exemplify this, this idea in different ways, and it'll come up throughout the talk. Um, hopefully you'll notice certain continuities throughout the talk. But um, these are the artists, next few artists I'll talk about, form the points of the compass for me. Um, because as I became interested in art, I became interested in it from this perspective of how it really orients us in the big way, like how it orients us um, to our sense of existence, our sense of humanness. So that's why um, my uh, probably north point of the compass is Eve Klein, um, the work known as Leap into the Void, 
And uh, this was actually, don't worry, nobody was hurt in the making of this artwork. Um, this was, even though it was 1961, it was a doctored photograph, um, double negative, I guess, double exposure. And um, um, it's funny because I always understood this as a sort of like, as a symbol of a leap into the unknown, which is to say a kind of leap into the future. I, 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 I sort of, I always understood it to some extent as a, as an as as symbolizing courage, which is the very very archetype of creativity, right? That you have to somehow do the thing which is completely unknowable because it has never it has not yet been done, and um, and and suddenly I I realized that actually maybe the meaning is actually brought that but broader, um, and it's relevant that it first appeared in a fake. Newspaper. Oh, for those people who are too young in the audience to know, this is a newspaper here on the, on the right. It's, we, people used to get these like, every day and read them. And, um, and I think that um, the, the tension um, between, on the one hand, this symbol of, um, like of you could say, of, of the infinite, right, which is the, the photograph, this idea of being completely disconnected from the very laws of nature, Right, disconnected from the laws of gravity, that you can just sort of be suspended in air without any dependence upon um, uh, the world. Um, you know, this is basically sort of existing in a space of the infinite. Um, the fact that that is actually first appears in the place that's actually the most finite, the most mundane, right? What's more finite than the daily newspaper? Because you would read it and then you wouldn't even recycle it. <laughs> Right? You would just throw it away, you know, and, um, and I think that that's, so like that I think already forms the contrast that interests me. Um, and the artist though that I think really better represents the other point of the compass in opposition to Yves Klein is Bastian Otter. And you know, Bastian Otter um, was also a performance artist or also did performance art, he did other things like Yves Klein. But um, his, he did a series of works which were about falling. Like where he, he, he fell, he fell into the canal. He's from, he's a, he was a, this is a work from um, early 1970s. And um, he would, uh, he was a Dutch artist. Um, uh, Yves Klein being a French artist, but uh, I think their works are very much, and working a generation or maybe 10 years earlier, but their works are very much in dialogue because Bastian Otter is interested in like the very element of human frailty, right? There's something so material, so about our bodies that we, that we crumble. Like we think of ourselves as noble, but that's just a fantasy we have, a story we have about ourselves. We're just these physical bodies, just connected to the earth and we will, um, you know, soon at some point be a part of that. And so in some ways, this, like, that's right here, the like some place better than this place, the idea that art can actually take you to the space of the, in, of the infinite and no place better than this place, right? That we need to understand our own connection to the finite. Um, this is actually something um, that I actually see also archetypally, um, this duality, I see as it, the, in Van Gogh, the um, uh, relationship in Van Gogh's paintings between the sun and the sunflower. Right, that the in the sunflower uh, for Van Gogh was never sort of just this fullness. It's always in some way looking. It's always wilted by its relationship to the sun. So that um, here and you'll have just um, just two Van Gogh paintings depicting that. You see that the the sunflowers like have this. Um, first of all, interestingly, you know he's painting these sunflowers not in their nobility, not in their stalks, not sort of live, but, off, but on the ground. Um, their face is on the ground, <laughs> in a way. Um, and then, the, but his images of the sun are so important as well. And so for Van Gogh, it's between spirit and matter. This contrast between sun and earth, uh, sky and um, uh, the land. And so, so uh, interestingly, Van Gogh, in, when he was in Arles, he wrote on the wall of his studio, um, like, I am the Holy Spirit. So in some ways, if you imagine, you know, this between 
like this relationship is between spirit and man, um, then the Holy Spirit would be to be in between those two, to be in between sort of the spirit and man. And the artist is the one who makes that connection, which explains why he's going back and forth. You know, so if you want to understand a little bit about how I art, or I don't know if this is how I art or why, it might be relevant to you to know that I sort of stayed up really late last night rereading re an, an essay that I read like maybe 20 times before about Van Gogh and sunflowers that my dissertation advisor, Eric Michaud, wrote. Um, and, like, and I'm still interested in, in these subjects and I feel like they, they become ever present for me that I'm always like looking back at these kind of, at these issues that, that, that somehow grip me. Even though Van Gogh is somebody who is sort of before my time professionally, I'm not professionally, I'm not responsible for knowing anything about Van Gogh, you know, to do my job well. It's not on my performance evaluation. <laughs> um, but um, closer to home is the artist Joseph Boys. Uh, Joseph Boys um, was an artist who did also, like many of these other um, artists, worked in the um, th th that I admire in this way, worked in the 1960s and 70s, um, you know, through the 80s, but um, this is a relatively unknown work that he did in 1971. Um, it's called Bog Action. Now, I'd be really impressed if anybody here knows about Joseph Boy's Bog Action. He's a German artist who was interested in um, re-mythologizing, you can say, modern life, finding the, the sort of sickness of our own detachment from things that have transcendent meaning, sort of religiosity, have, have a sort of mythical power to them. Um, as a society, as we live in these um, spaces with you know, clean walls and we have our normal you know, manners to us uh, of relating and our instrumental lives where we work to be able to earn money to support ourselves, and we, we've lost the sense of tribal um, ritual that, that, that he admired so much. Um, I think he forms actually a, another interesting contrast to Eve Klein, um, especially with this work, Bog Action, because here all he did is in this performance is simply like, go to a bog <laughs> and, sort of, and sort of immerse himself in this bog. Now, I, I, I love that. I, I actually... I'm not totally clear on what exactly a bog is, but as I understand it, it's something like, um, it's, it's a place which is like neither a body of water nor dry land, right? And, it, and it's because of its biochemical properties, it, um, it, it, it is actually holds like primordial history in it, right? So when we find bodies you know, preserved for thousands of years, they're in bogs. Um, and so the way I see this work is, is I see it as in some ways him attempting to find like, something like the source, right? The source uh, connected to our meaning, our humanness um, on earth through the portal of the bog. So instead of through, through the air, um, in, instead of thinking about like what is um, some place other than this place as being um, like a kind of mind space, as a fantasy space, which you might associate with the sun or the sky, um, he saw it as like through the physical stuff of the earth. That's how we find the source of like um, of meaning. And trying, you could even say um, like that's where the maybe the infinite lies through the material. Um, and a student of his, or a follower of, hers, of his, um, Marina Abramovich, some of you may know, um, uh, I think pursued somewhat of a similar analogous approach to Joseph Boy's, where um, she did a series of performances where she let in these performances a whole range of uh, actions be born upon her physically. Um, in the mo one, one of the most powerful ones, this one called Rhythm Zero in 1974, um, she just had for her performance um, a table in a gallery with uh, objects on it, and the objects would be um, a rose, 
a scissors, um, a pen, um, all kinds of, uh, uh, a gun, you know, a knife. And, um, and people could do whatever they wanted to her with those things. And what, and, and it was incredibly, um, uh, like striking, the photographs of this performance are incredibly striking. Um, because, and what she's trying to do in all of her performances is she's trying to connect with some part of herself that is more essential, more, um, you could say more universal than anything that could be felt physically as uh, an action on her. So she's trying to imagine art as being like sort of deeper than the body. And how can you imagine, you know, that is to actually allow herself to endure that intensity herself, and that actually is how you get to essence. And art is, is the, always about finding the portal to essence, you know, in some ways for her. And, and when she does a series of performances with her then boyfriend, Ulai, um, like this one, which is, I think, um, one of the most beautiful images you can find of um, symbolizing love. Right? Like, you know, you have you know, two people leaning back with a loaded um, bow and arrow um, as a symbol of vulnerability, symbol of trust. And so she's getting at is like the essence of love, the essence of relation. Nothing, there's nothing about her relationship with Ulai in its particular nature. It's about its universal quality. It's insofar as they, as individuals, share, um, are participating in something, some, some way of connecting on a universal level. And, um, and I feel like there's you know, many parallels with Joseph Boys, and this is a, a wonderful work that he um, did that has always formed for me, like always comes back to me in my mind, especially as how I think about how to run the museum. Um, and it says, we can't do it without the rose. We can't do it without the rose. And he would engage in conversations because for him, the conversation was a, a, an example of direct action that had impact on the world and then created ripple effects throughout the world. Um, but you can't just have the conversation. Like you have to have the conversation with the rose there. The rose is, symbolizes art, right? And therefore, um, it's, the art becomes like the necessary backdrop to giving meaning to the ability to set in motion new processes through language, through talk. And all of these, this cluster of artists, form for me this kind of like points of the compass. Um, and I, I, one way of summarizing in some ways, like why all this matters to me is um, I became a curator because I wasn't religious enough to be a rabbi. And, and, and I think that that's like what I really always cared about is the big stuff. I just, I've always been drawn um, to, to the things that like I would describe literally as like humanist. And when I say humanist, I don't just mean it in as like, oh, relates to people. But no, relates to people insofar as they have in common something about being human. The fact that they will, we will all struggle with things like the like fact that we will die. The fact that we have to um, want to have some relationship to each other. The fact that we need to try to understand our relationship to what's around us, our world. Like the fundamental questions of what it means to be human, um, those are the questions that have always interested me. And when I, when I came to the museum, first came to the museum, um, I very much wanted to address like, those humanist questions. Um, so much so that, for example, when um, Nora Abrams, our curator, um, proposed that we have an exhibition of Fred Sandback um, back in 2011. Um, this is uh, examples of Fred Sandback's work. Um, I said, uh, yes, I think that we should definitely have an exhibition of Fred Sandback's work, but we should give him the entire building, every inch of it. And that was to me um, because 
it would be too easy if you were to look at this work, and by the way, there's nothing more than what you see right here. That's it, that's the work. Because these are not bad photographs, this is the whole thing. Um, we didn't have like fantastic attendance, I want to let you know, <laughs> during this. But, um, but what he does in his work is um, simply stretch pieces of yarn or other forms of string across the room. And you know, if there was in one gallery, then people might say like, oh, that's interesting. And it's like, a, it seemed like it's a kind of like, an artist is doing this interesting thing with shapes. And he's, you know, really exploring how shape um, is created without form, or how space is manipulated, and how the building can become a frame. You can have all these theoretical understandings of it. But when you give him the whole building, I felt like you're increasing the stakes so much that actually you're saying, um, no, this is somebody who we don't just think is interesting, we believe in him. And he, he's, he died at the t already by the time we did this exhibition, um, but when he was alive still, um, we would do is, um, what he would do is he would sit in a room sometimes for a day or two before deciding where to stretch the string. He would just sit there in a chair um, until something, something emerged for him. And I want to say, like, I actually really believe in Fred Sandback. I think that he goes so far as to um, really divide sacred and profane. Like that actually, because he's doing so little, it resonates everywhere. He actually, he's, it's like he owns the air <laughs> as well. And that's, and, and sort of, and gives it all electricity by the fact that he's, he's just done so little. He's, 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 it's like because he's so gentle, that's how um, he's so powerful. And, um, and so, like, again, this was because I believed, I believed so much in him, that's why I wanted to, 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 to do it, to put, to put so much on the line personally for it, um, so that people, because otherwise, otherwise museums never really put anything on the line, actually. Because if someone doesn't like an exhibition, well, we have another one in three months, or it's right, you can come back, and yeah, you get criticized, but you like something else, and there's nothing, the artist is the one who really has something on the line. I wanted to see if we could, as a museum, put something actually more at stake in the way that artists put things at stake. And, um, and that was putting more of the institution behind it. Um, so other exhibitions around that time, when I came uh, and took over, um, an exhibition called Another Victory Over the Sun. And, um, and that, that had this work in it, which, um, if you guys, what, you guys don't remember this? <laughs> yeah, no, I, nobody was showing up at this time. Um, but, uh, but this is one of my favorite works. Um, it, it's, it's, it's called Waiting for Jerry. And it's, you're in a dark room, and in fact, part of the concept behind the whole exhibition is that the entire museum was darkened. So it's a museum that's 75% window. We, like I had the idea, like, let's darken it. Like, what do we do with that? Let's darken it. You know, so we darkened the entire building and then made all of the works have be illuminated. And, um, and what's beautiful about this work is waiting for Jerry. So that means that like, so Jerry, remember, in, the, in the music of Tom and Jerry is playing, and Tom and Jerry, cat and mouse, um, and Jerry was the mouse. So waiting for Jerry um, means that, like, that you're the one who's in the mouse hole, right? So it's, it's waiting for you. Tom is waiting for you. And, and in some ways, so this is about, like, it's about, this is about death, right? It's about, or it, you could also say it's about courage, right? It's about the courage to leave your home, knowing that, um, as Hannah Arendt will say, like, when you leave the four walls of the home, that requires courage because that is a place where life is no longer the primary value. And so I feel like this work is to me like the most, you know, incredibly profound, even just though it does, it's so, there's so little involved there. Um, during that same exhibition, Another Victory Over the Sun, um, we also would show um, works like this by Spencer Finch, where there'd be a fake moonlight over a pool that we created in the, I don't know why they stopped me from making exhibitions um, over a pool that we, <laughs> that we installed in the gallery. Um, and so it's, so another victory of the sun referenced the uh, early 20th century opera 
um, called Victory Over the Sun, which is a Russian avant-garde opera. And it really was this celebration of modern ability to create our own world. That, like, that actually we, don't, we no longer need to be dependent on nature, that actually we can build the world according to our imagination. Um, and so in some ways this is a really good example of that. Um, the next exhibition, or around the same time, um, featured um, this work by Samuel Beckett, and this was similar to Juan Munoz, um, simply a lips, simply mouth, um, in a dark room. All you can see in the dark room is this mouth, and the mouth is talking, and, and it's this monologue that's ever going monologue very rapidly, and, um, but it's the, mo the monologue is expressing the idea of, um, of, of, of trying to emerge. And, and, and the one thing, the one word that this mouth cannot say is I, and every time it kind of approaches that word has to then backtrack because actually um, what's happening is that this, this mouth cannot yet emerge as a subjective individual, it cannot emerge yet as a person. And that's, you know, what is the idea behind looking for the face I had before the world was made, right? Like, like what are we before we enter society as individuals, as our social being? Um, with our subjectivity. And, um, and I think this was just a powerful way of addressing that. Another work that did that um, in this exhibition was Lorraine O'Grady. This, this series of works called Miscegenated Family Album featured photographs of her and her family, as you see on the right, juxtaposed with very weirdly similar images of Nefertiti from ancient Egypt and Nefertiti's family. And uh, amazing, there's like the commonalities between them. And what she's doing is she's sort of finding a humanist project internal to cultural identity. So trying to find within a sort of Africanness or within, you know, within um, blackness, a sort of a, an essence to that, a sort of idea before history, before you get to science, you have an essence that can transcend that. Um, which I think was um, an idea, the idea of looking at essence within particularities, which is a paradox, because usually the idea of essence is, automatically goes to universality. But that's um, you know, something that you have uh, Judy Chicago doing as well within the feminist movement. And this is a series of photographs, sorry, a series of paintings that she did early 70s um, called Through the Flower. What I love about these is that um, they are both flower and sun, right? So both spirit and earth. Um, but, but they're also like idealizations. And, and they're idealizations, essence that are, in some ways, she's trying to find essence of something like womanness within this essence. And um, I think that they become interesting contrast to other uses of the flower at the time, um, particularly Andy Warhol, and who made his flower prints just about five years earlier, 1964, Warhol made these flower works. Um, and you usually, and I think it's an insightful comparison because you, while you see Warhol here is much more um, grounded, like even in the, with the grass, looks actually, it's photographic, right? You can actually see like sort of something like real, it looks a little bit like real grass. And in fact, it's a photograph of real grass. Um, but it's, but, but the way that Warhol blows out these flowers, makes you realize that Warhol was not always as fully interested in like reality, in just reproducing the real world, the actualities of our world in art. Like it's not just soup or art. It's actually an ideal, some idealization of the world. Like these are actually in some ways, when, when you see them next to a very strong idealization, you see that actually the flowers become like sim more like symbols, which is a way you don't need to think about Warhol. Um, but one thing uh, you, you do sort of understand about Warhol um, is that he always wanted to have himself photographed within his art. <laughs> and I think this is actually very, very meaningful because um, it's as if like he is saying, um, like the, my art 
is my nature, right? Like, I don't want to be connected to, like, the world of nature. I don't want to escape to the bog. I want to um, be surrounded by, like, the worldliness of the world. And I, that's why he's sort of surrounded by this sort of fake garden of flowers. He's immersing himself. And, and that's the idea of, you know, not having a victory. I'm sorry, that, that's, like, that is the idea of having a victory over the sun, right? And it's very idea. It's in some ways the idea of also thinking about no place better than this place. Like this world that's human made, like that's the best that we do when we actually create those things. Um, and, and flowers were, were poignant at the time in the 1960s um, because that was part of the flower power um, era and it was, it was a cr crucial symbol. And what you have here on the left is, in fact, a very interesting story because that's actually um, a figure named George Edgerly Harris. Um, and he was a young student. He's the young student gently putting flowers in the rifle barrels of the National Guardsmen at an anti-war protest in Washington, D.C. And he was actually, at the time, on his way to the West Coast to join a commune called Califlower, and from Califlower, he then um, created his own co commune. Um, he changed his name to Hibiscus, and she formed the commune called uh, um, the Coquettes. Here, uh, Hibiscus um, performed with the Coquettes, both on stage and in the street, and you can't say they were in drag. You see Hibiscus has uh, a beard, and, and Fayette was biologically female. People were not, they, they, what they wanted to do was just disrupt gender, and in some ways you could say invent gender as a creative act. Um, and they performed on stage at the Palace Theater, but they also dressed this way on the streets, and they didn't make a distinction between life and art, stage and street. And we exhibited these as part of the exhibition of the American Counterculture in 2011. And what I think is important is this contrast between these two versions of um, Hibiscus and George Harris. Because to me, they form analogs to art and the kinds of art that has always interested me ever since my dissertation. And by the way, oh, what's, it, what's today's date? The 11th? On the 15th, I write my last check to whatever check is. I, I pay I have my last payment to my student loan. <laughs> yeah, I know, is that great? Yeah. <laughs> Just right before I finish at the MCA. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Johns Hopkins. Um, so, um, you know, um, there's something about this sort of archetype um, of this du duality that works for me. Like, because um, in the East Coast, George Harris has a flower as a symbol at arm's distance, right? But when he moves to the West Coast, he becomes the flower, right? So if a flower is, we can, we can take flower as standing for art in general, right? The idea of art as being at a remove from ourselves, the thing that happens in galleries, things that has a title, things that have a title and a, a date, um, frame, pedestal, um, things that are treated differently than other things and you have to pay more to ship them. Well, like that's sort of the sort of more traditional in some sense, even East Coast <laughs> model. Um, whereas uh, in the West Coast, hibiscus embodies art, expresses it, just is the flower. And that's where art is lifestyle. And I would even say, and I can argue this, and this is a longer argument, that in fact, I, that, that the concept of lifestyle that you know it today began with sort of hibiscus. Actually, I think he's, he's like, he, hibiscus is the, the model for what lifestyle is now. And, um, and, and in many ways, like the, 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 these are legendary characters. But the important point is that this is exactly the analog, the anal analog between um, the sort of Lincoln Memorial with its symbolic ideas of art that would require education um, and the sort of distance and remove 
you take up steps to, to go walk to it. And this sort of idea of Mount Rushmore as art that's just connected directly to people in a way, these two. But it's also ideas about the formal ideas of art and the informal ideas of art that inform everything that I think I was interested in. And I suddenly became interested in that as the way I started thinking about the duality. Um, now, I had a conversation with the founder of Burning Man um, at a, on a panel. We were both on the same panel and um, when he was alive, obviously. Um, and, um, and we, we were, t and I asked him, I said to him, um, do you believe in the idea of fine art? And he, he, he responded very, like, he, he took the question with the generous spirit that I meant it, and he said, you know, if there were two islands, and one island it was like just all self-expression, just people just doing the things that they felt inside, and making and, and creating and relating in just every new creative, interesting ways. And then the other islands were all the monuments of culture. He said, I would definitely want to live on the first island, but I would visit the second island every once in a while. And I felt like it was a really beautiful way of thinking about that dualism, and I felt like in the way I ran and the museum, I also cared about that duality, and I tried to make our exhibitions um, also reflect that, because there's the tradition on the, you know, the left, the Andy Warhol, even Andy Warhol still always sort of made art that had a title and a date and was very, you know, and was very much art. And the coquettes, you know, they never ever wanted to be too arty. They never ever, the, re the reason it was so hard to do this exhibition of them is that they didn't save things because it was just their life. And other people might have done, had photographs of them, but they didn't care about it. And I feel like that duality it, it, you know, really marks two different traditions within American history and culture. And the fact that I was interested in this, this sort of lifestyle aspect of art and culture, um, to me, I mean, it was, a, was maybe a reflection of something that maybe even a bigger like, like driver for me, you can say, and that is that I did the things that frightened me. Because remember, like, I was the guy who definitely didn't want to be that like, Queen's square dancer my, uh, my, my whole life. I wanted to like, study philosophy and understand the sort of humanist ideas. I wanted to be the, you know, the sort of elevated philosophical thinker and to, 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 to actually look at culture that was not sanctified as being elevated and interesting was scary to me. And in every way, what I tried to do as a director is think like, what's scary to me and therefore let me do that thing. And I want to say like thinking a lot about artists who are not a part of, it's not, not, like Eve Klein, as crazy as he was to leap into space, he is in every single textbook of art history um, of the 20th century. He's a monumental figure. Joseph Boyce is there too, even Marina Abramovich, right? But like I was interested in those people who were, who were not that, who were, had not even been defined as artists. And I found that actually in a student of student, in quotes, of Andy Warhol, and someone who admired Andy Warhol, and that was Mark Mothersbaugh. And that was, I think, like, probably, if you guys want to judge me on one thing, please judge me on this exhibition, because I think it's like, like the best thing I ever did. Um, and um, uh, I would say that you know, what I think you see in this is, um, like here as a student at Kent State University, he is, just wants to make art like Andy Warhol. Um, and he makes these, these are decals that he puts up around campus before there was a concept of street art. Um, but then May 4th, 1970, the shootings at Kent State happened. He experienced the horror of having his classmates die. Um, and that trauma was, affects him even still to this day. He made art like these small postcards that actually represented in many ways the chaos of the world that he saw around him, but he also made art, on the other hand, that became a mirror, not of the chaos, but of our modern tendency to, to just order our lives despite the fact that there's chaos everywhere. The sort of 
this attempt to have this rigid mecha mechanistic structures of production and um, uh, our habituated life that are completely inhuman. And so they, was, they were obsessed with sort of re reproducing the orderly aspects of society. And so therefore, um, he created a, an art collective known as Devo and that looked at the de-evolution of our society, the fact that we are not becoming more civilized, but we are increasingly becoming less civilized. And what this, this by the way, became a band. Um, it became a very popular band too, especially as the music industry um, by 1978 was trying to find a bridge between rock and disco. And Devo, which you know, had like, a, was a rock band with a beat, actually formed a, a convenient bridge and therefore they became a successful part, you know, pop band and they were actually quite innovative in what they did. But I think one of the things that interested me at first about them is their place in history. Because the style that you know as the, the 80s actually in many ways originated with Mark Mothersbaugh and Devo. And like the whole synthetic quality that they give to their um, outfits, their styling, um, was the exact contrast to the previous generations, the previous decades sort of earthiness sort of this attempt to go, the, the back to the land element of the American counterculture believed in this, um, look of, in, in looking for the face before the world was made, connecting to the sun, connecting to nature, and sort of trying to build the world out of nature. In many ways, Clark Rickard is a really great example um, of uh, the back to the land movement and uh, the attempt to, to recreate structures and systems that actually more closely mirror the very essence of our cosmos. Um, and what I think uh, uh, is happening with, um, you know, with Devo was this sort of this shift, this attempt to say like, let's invent as artists, which is to say as moderns, like our own world because that, that is how we demonstrate our agency. That's really what it means to be DIY, is, if, is, it, is you can really emphasize your DIY-ness by, by being synthetic, not being slavish to nature, but actually by, through your inventiveness. And so in many ways, you can see that parallel within the sort of rock versus um, disco um, tendencies where rock didn't understand disco because it just seemed artificial. What they didn't, what Rock didn't understand is that um, that artifice was creativity and, it, it, and invention. And Disco didn't understand Rock because what seemed as just crude was they understood as authentic, right? And it's an attempt to get to some authentic sense of self. But they're actually just two concepts, two different concepts of authenticity. And this actually had been an idea that had been in culture already. Um, from, I think, for just from an earlier period in the 1970s, where if you compare sort of Woodstock, you know, here you have the Grateful Dead playing at Woodstock. Most bands are playing at, in, at Woodstock had, were, were under the spell of authenticity, that actually many bands at the time would play with their back to the audience because that, that emphasized the internal, authentic, creative process. It's actually coming from welled up deep within. Um, and then that's actually why David Bowie was such a sort of um, bolt of lightning out of a, in a clear blue sky for people because he was theater. He said, you know, I, my authenticity comes from my, my being, an art, being an artist in front of you. And, and I think that that, again, that tension I think is, is, is very real. Devo is clearly on the, um, on the element of, of theater. Um, and, you know, and that's why David Bowie was the one who first sort of promoted them. And David Bowie um, was the one who, who stood up in 1978 at Max's Kansas City in New York and said, this is the band of the future. And he even announced that he was going to produce their first album. And um, because he saw, he saw the aspect of theater and what they do. And we always, demon we of course demonize the 80s as being artificial. But that's just our own tendency to bias. Um, like the sort of authentic, we, to believe that things that are somehow have patina, that have dust on them are more authentic than things have new. And I feel like in many ways, one of the things that I try to do in a global sense at the museum is to create 
in, instill within people the fact, the, the idea that you can have newness and authenticity both. That I mean, in many ways, that's the whole idea of this Union Station neighborhood, right? Is, like, is this idea that actually it's, is, it's possible for a place to have authenticity um, and also be completely fresh, but um, it, it, that requires creativity. If it's interesting, if it's different, if it feels like it's carving its own path, then it's authentic. It doesn't need the external trappings of it. Um, what I found, what I really learned though, with um, Mother's Ba, actually screw it, I'm like, it's my last lecture. I'm gonna go like, a little bit longer. <laughs> like, <laughs> go just a little bit longer. Um, uh, what I really learned with him, though, was um, something much more important than the historical lesson. I, 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 at first, I was interested in him because of like, oh, he helps me tell this story about the history of American thought um, from the, as it emerged from the counterculture to today, to understand the way we world, live the world. But, I, but, but the, you actually see a, a clue of it in the character on the left. And um, so Devo was not just this mechanical, robotic, repetitive um, group. It was that and also this sort of this chaotic character that was known as Boogie Boy that Mark Mothersbaugh played. That was this child man character, man child, you could say, character. And so you have both the sort of orderly mirror of our orderly society and also this sort of uncontrolled sort of spirit, this Dionysian kind of um, symbol within Mark Mothersbaugh, and that, uh, that's symbolized by the child, an aspect of child's play. And that character was, 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 um, it was a alter ego for, for Mark. He always played um, this boogie boy every live Devo show. He would come out and it's sort of speak in this stream of consciousness as this, um, the id of our culture, so, you know, and it, which represents as I see it in some ways, always the possibility of art to organically emerge from the sort of in between the crack, from the cracks of our modern edifice. And, um, and but, but it was that aspect of child's, the child's play that suddenly I sort of, sort of start to connect with and understood and start to even change me. Because Marx's art was so different from everything that I loved in art. Like, this is the kind of stuff that he would draw, and I would be, I would be terrified as I was looking at his drawings, because like, I like, you know, Joseph Boy's bog action, because that's his attempt to discover the primordial aspect of humanness, and, and like, here's a cute drawing. I was very, very, this was very foreign to me. Um, I spent like 20 trips going to LA to make this exhibition or so. And what was amazing is what I found happened was that I suddenly like got this sort of childlike element of his work. I, I didn't just sort of see it as a really interesting example of a sort of tradition of art, but I actually started to really like it. I felt my taste change from this academic that, you know, approach that I had, this sort of more rabbinical approach. And I sort of, I even began to see the seriousness in the playfulness of it. And so whereas I had, you know, a very, very, um, like I had the approach to art that was very much at first centered on gravitas, I, I learned that there's an element of art that's about play that, that may be in some ways more essential to understanding like the real value of art in our culture as being the thing that disrupts things um, out, it takes us out of our ordinary rational approach to control everything. To be adults takes us out of that possibility. And, um, and that's actually why after the Mark Mothersbaugh exhibition, um, I did this exhibition of Nathan Carter, uh, who here he does, he has an all women's punk band that he creates the sets for in this extremely childlike way. He makes a movie, he just has the, the figures just kind of, he just kind of moves them like this to, to make them talk, you know, because that, that's how he animates them. Um, and, you know, and, and so, so Mark's work was actually, like, he was interested in, um, he was actually interested in order and sort of this childlike disruption of order. Here he, in, inspired by my own story, he starts to actually work with square dancing and he created, uh, square dance patterns that then had, he had these roly-poly childlike characters like attempt to figure out. 
and the sort of comp and and so again he's always playing with that dichotomy and that's actually what started to really um, like resonate with me and I, I saw this one um, ballet this one dance um, in Frankfurt that uh, I kept on thinking of over and over again as I was doing this exhibition. It was by William Forsythe. It, it was called Loss of Small Detail. And, um, and, and in, this, in this dance, this is the, the motif, the theme that continually reemerged. It was a quote from Yukio Mishima, the Japanese author. And the theme was, the sublime pertains by nature only to an exterior, which conceals a core of nonsense. Right? This idea that what's really meaningful, that's just the surface of things. Um, but, the, but after that, there is no meaning. It's chaos. It's nonsense. But then he continues. He says, or does the sublime indeed pertain to the whole, but a ludicrous dust settles upon it? And what I love about that is that those two things are held in balance. Right? That somehow, like, we, we, we face the possibility that everything might be meaningful, and the appearance of, uh, that it's not is just a sort of surface effect, on the one hand. <laughs> on the other hand, maybe it's about that nothing is meaningful, <laughs> meaningful, and the appearance of actual meaning is just a surface effect that we've just, like, we want to believe there is some meaning to it all. And the, the idea of that's actually what made me sort of understand, like, the, like, the, in some ways, like the, lud the power of the ludicrous, right? The power of the, the play. And um, I won't um, go much into, oh, actually, I will just very quickly just go through. Um, like, so the historical mention, the, mention like the exhibitions that we've done at the museum always try to reflect this alternative to the, um, to the tradition of the mainstream that most museums of contemporary art will show. So we began with, you see what you see above, you know, the Clark Rickard began with this uh, exhibition of um, the American counterculture, which you know, inherited from the Beats, this idea of back to the land, creating art just as a way of living life, as a way of living the world you want to live in. You know, and then it went through the Coquettes, which were a part of that. The, the, the punk movement, which is considered often like oppositional to the hippies, really were just a continuation of their DIY spirit you know, through Mark Mothersbaugh, and then these traditions of thought and art making continued throughout our culture, even though they were not in any way a part of the New York art world. Like, I gave Mark Mothersbaugh his retrospective, even though no other curator had ever given him a spective. Like, <laughs> right? Like, he was not part of the New York art world, but I believe he was a part of the history of American culture that it was something that was so powerful. And that, that traveled through skate culture, through surf culture, through street art. And that's the tradition that we've always been exhibiting at the museum, which is why we exhibited sort of, you know, um, graffiti, a uh, graf history of graffiti. And the history of graffiti is what gave birth to Jean-Michel Basquiat before he started to make things that would eventually go into art galleries. He was making them on the walls of the streets. And it was artists like Cleon Peterson who um, became popularized through their street art. That, that's how they can become connected to American culture. And those are the artists who we exhibited alongside people who are more commonly accepted, uh, through, who, are, who travel through the institutions of art that are based in New York. And I think that all of this, in some level, is like I believe in the American project. And for me, the American project was, is that, is that marriage of the organic aspects of culture with our attempts to find something that elevates us always. To, so, to somehow like embrace what is as something beautiful, to embrace like that, say that, you know, that there's no place better than this place, and yet also still believe in some place better than this place. Like to me, that's how I understand the American project. I'm much more interested in the American project than I am in the, in the art historical project, you know, the sort of the history of images history of making. To me, the history of culture is, is, is the world in which that becomes meaningful, the, the history of images becomes meaningful. Um, and that's why like, we've always held, the, held those dichotomies, you know, where we would exhibit Marilyn Minter alongside a, a tattoo artist who, who, who pioneered um, a certain technique of tattoo making. You know, and um, where we would exhibit works that had like a connection to the language of contemporary art, like this amazing work by Gonzalo Labrija. But also, I think what interested me personally in my own personal explorations is also just the art that's 
that, that's not aspiring to have monumental significance. It actually has expressive and playful significance, like this um, stack of cards at, at Burning Man. And I feel like, to me, uh, that the, 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 I've always been interested in the way that those two create productive tensions, to, to actually make the, think about the museum as a kind of uh, an island of two islands. Thanks. Well, it depends. Like, my father would not be happy with my, if I was like the, like the president, and my f <laughs> and and like, there would still be like, a problem with the, the way I was president. And my mother would be happy if I was like the janitor. You know, I feel like like so it doesn't really matter in that way. And believe me, like um, my father would probably say that's right. Yeah, they, like he, he, would, he, would, he wouldn't he wouldn't disagree. Um, and. Um, but you know, I feel like uh, your, my path, you know, unfolds the way the way it does, and and I, and I you know, different people. I, I aspired, I aspired to, to to academic life. I always thought I was going to be a professor. It's really weird, but then I realized there's something more deeply connected to to culture that interested me, and in becoming a curator just felt more right than than doing that, becoming a professor. So that's that was in between there between rabbi and curator. Yes? You talked a lot about duality. Um, do you think you've had a chance to play with the intersection or yeah. the spectrum or polarity more? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. Because in fact, um, what, what you start to realize in everything is that everything always switches on itself, right? And therefore, like, while it's, value, while it's useful for me to think in dualities, because I always do, like in many ways, um, every dualism that, you, that 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 emerges always gets gets reversed. Like you know, in in the same way that um, whereas boys Joseph Boys was sort of looking looking deep, digging deep into the earth, that doesn't mean he was more therefore grounded. In some ways, he found in earthiness transcendence, right? And, and even in even in this work. You know, there's something about the sort of, um, there's something like uh, thinking about Burning Man as creating like an ideal space as much as, you know, this is actually more of a real space. Um, that it's not that like the art world. And so therefore, it's helpful for me always to think about things in terms of dualities, but it's important to note that they're never stable for me. And in fact, in fact like always um, like, uh, it's always in, in, in between points because everything will share elements of both. But it's almost like it's, a, it's almost like the mapping is useful to think about in duality to, to to parse what's there, even though I know that there is what's there has the entire the, the entire range probably. Right. Well, I think that's a great um, way of thinking about what we do and how I've actually uh, tried to, to create the organization. Because we've had over a hundred events um, at the museum in a year, um, which is not typical for a museum, um, especially with our scale. So we're very much an experience-oriented museum, and um, in many ways, I was very influenced by the philosopher Hannah Arendt in that. And Hannah Arendt. Um, in the book, The Human Condition, she set out this idea that um, it's the artists who build the walls of the city in which it becomes possible for people to interrelate. So therefore, like, you know, um, she says in some ways, the artists are most at home in a world of things, and they are the ones who are necessary. They create the stable world in which, in which like, the uncertain um, relationships occur. And I believe in, in many ways that that's a great way of thinking about art, and I've always sort of created the museum that way. Um, like, that actually we have this sort of sacred 
kind of core because of the art. In many ways, the sacred walls because of the art. And that gives meaning to all of the interactions that, that occur here. And people say like, oh, well, like you guys just have parties and what's that about? And I say, oh, that's very good, we have parties. You know, I think that it's very important, first of all, I think to add the elements of chaos into, like, which, into a museum, a place of order, um, because um, you know, that's basically, the, that's connecting more closely to the essence of art. But also, I think that um, uh, like, that's when you start to really imprint in people like, something that's meaningful in their lives, when you, can be, when you can become a part of the events that punctuate their lives and give meaning, give it meaning. So therefore, it's thinking about the museum in its role in relationship to the city and, and therefore like, in, the way, in its ability to create um, a society <laughs> like, uh, that is like, of meaning, a society of meaning, really. Yeah, so I really I believe in all of that. Yeah, and Mark, since then. What do you sort of observe as the unique sort of defining cultural production or characteristic of the community that you've been yeah. such an image part of? Well, I think there's a few things I want to acknowledge. I think first of all, I think there's an element of privilege that I want to you know, that I, that I partake in to be able to even create this the way I did. Like, sort of even a white male privilege that allowed me to take chances um, in a way for, that might have been harder for other people to sort of do the things that I did and still be um, sort of accepted uh, and, and, and sort of be trusted. Because I think that doing newness, I think, requires people to have, give you a certain amount of trust. Having, you know, other things, I think it was helpful to have a PhD when you're gonna also, like, you know, show an artist who um, like makes little toys, <laughs> um, like roly polies. Um, like, oh, it's serious. Like, oh, okay. Um, but, um, but I, I think that there's that. I think that really, re what I was tapping into was it was an S, was something in Denver, and Denver, and somebody's called me because of that. And I think that um, the way I really think it relates to um, status um, because. Um, I think that the more common on the East Coast is to use institutions um, for status, and therefore they feed back the systems that like that underlie that. So, for example, like uh, museums need to continue to be museum-y in order to be able to reliably provide the stature that they people want from them when they sort of are involved with them. Um, I think that. Denver, uh, and then on the other hand, you also have a certain kind of um, countercultural West Coast distrust of institutions where, like, why, can't we, why don't we just create it ourselves? Why don't we just, why do we need institutions? I think Denver has this relationship to institutions where we believe in them only insofar as they do things that are interesting for us. Like, oh, this is, a, it's a vehicle to change things. And because people are not asking for status from them, I think they're free to then become that vehicle. And so basically, people were very, very allowing of me to sort of move this institution um, the way that, in different ways, because it seemed interesting. And, um, and I feel like culturally, Denver is therefore characterized by openness. Um, at least openness to newness in many ways. And, um, and uh, be, for, for all of those reasons, and, and also like culturally, the idea of the, um, the West, which, which even though it's an idea, it's the sun, it's not you know, the sunflower, um, even though the idea of the West, I mean, it's also the sunflower, right? It's also the physical space. But as an idea uh, for us, it is, um, it, it was productive. It's what in many ways drove like a lot of the pioneer quote, concept, but it, for all that, for all the problems associated with that, but it also drove a lot of the counterculture in the back to the land movement. So it was re-energized in the 70s, the idea of the West. And that connected very much to the sort of DIY, even though it's not, I wouldn't use it as DIY, but the sort of DIY, you don't think of Denver as being like a real DIY city, strictly speaking, um, but, but the spirit of making the world that you want to live in. Right, that you actually can come here 
to make that world that you think is a more interesting place. That's the idea of the West that is productive. And I think that that becomes cultural and that's why institutions can be tools for building that world. And that's what I feel like, I, that's why I feel like I, I had freedom to do this and I feel that, um, uh, and also, I don't, think, I don't think I could have done this either on the West Coast where people would have been too afraid oh, this is too much like who, how we actually are, to like, we, we need to prove, in fact, that we are serious art people like the East Coast. Or if I was in the East Coast, they just thought I was crazy, which they sometimes do. Most of, my, most of them are my family. But, um, but, but I think that, uh, I, feel like, I feel like what I did felt, like I think Denver called me because of, I'm very aligned with it, you know, with you know, maybe combining, I have the institutional the gravitas, um, and I still believe in the institutional gravitas and also the sort of, of the East Coast with the sort of sense of energy of the, of the West, um, I think. And um, yeah, thanks. Do, we, do, we, do you have one more question? How does that relate to the uh, general contemporary art world? First of all, I wanna say I care less about the art world than I care about um, as it relate to the currents of thought that take place in our culture, right? And, um, and it, it, it connects in many levels. First of all, there is the back to the land movement and, um, and then you could even dig deeper before that to like this utopian aspirations of Buckminster Fuller and utopian architecture. Um, then um, so then the back to the land movement, which I was referring to, creating the world you want to live in. Then following from that, um, he became interested in the pattern and, and decoration, right? Which was very much a, a current trend in art, but he's giving rationale for why we have a pattern and decoration movement, right? Um, by he's connecting it to these utopian aspirations of, you know, people like Buckminster Fuller. So people in art history would just refer to pattern and decoration as if it was like, a trend of art that was invented in like Soho, right? But in fact, what Clark Rickard is showing us is that pattern and decoration um, actually has very, very serious roots in sort of scientific ways of thinking. Um, so that's, and then, and then, you know, to like, so like all, in many ways, like all of the science and math are like very much connected to how people think about, um, you know, like, like it's, like, it's really, I think it's more current now, that the idea that, like, that science and math can be um, imported into a sort of art language and almost, almost whole cloth and appear unapologetically as art, as beautiful, even. <laughs>